And so we're going to continue with a little bit of this theory from chapter 12 with some problem solving. So kind of read through this quickly and uh, boot up Visual Studio while we're doing that. Create a program named Sales Tax Demo that declares an array of sale objects. And whether we do 10 or, or 3 is really not a big deal. Prompt the user for data for each object and display the 10 objects. Uh, again, so like just prompting the user for 10 things is, would take forever. So I'm thinking less things. And you know, whether this is a GUI or just like uh, some sort of loop in a command prompt, it's kind of flexible there. Data fields, okay, so for the sale objects, we've got inventory number, amount, and tax. So we've got three fields on our objects. Include a property with get and set accessors for the first two data fields, but make the tax owed a read-only property. Um, which means what? Read-only property means you don't have a get and a set block. You just have you just have a get block. Question or? Uh, will you be streaming this on Discord? Yeah, let's let's stream that on Discord. Sorry, thank you for the reminder. And click here, and click here, and click, click, click. Ah, uh, the tax is calculated when the sale is set. Assume the tax rate is 8% and 6% greater than 100. So it's, I can't think of any real world case where you get taxed less as the amount goes up on a sale of an item, but whatever, that's fine. And then, so that's kind of like part one. And then part two, create a program named demo two that after 10 objects are displayed, they are sorted and displayed again. Modify the sale so it's comparable. So uh, we'll learn how to sort. So let's kind of spin up a, um, little, I think I've already got one started in my repo. So let's get this opened. I think I just called it junk and then I called it class demo. This is just like a catch all repo that I'm using. And let's close this up, close this up. Add new project. Um, make a Windows form app. Sales demo. And right away, I'm going to add a C sharp class called, I think it just wants it to be called sale objects so we're going to call this singular sale s a l e dot c sharp mark it as public and it says it has three fields um data fields inventory number amount of sale and tax so inventory number i'll just assume you can have letters in there uh, amount private we're going to store our money in the decimal data type sale amount and the third is tax owed okay so um, again just kind of to review some of this theory and this is really good theory from chapter 12 these are known as instance fields, okay? The, the identifier naming convention that we use is this underscore notation, which I've seen a fair amount to say that your instance fields start with an underscore. Again, you're kind of learning these different variables have different names. If variables are in your methods, they're called parameters. 
If variables are declared inside of your method, they're called local variables. If you have a class and that class has data um, that, that each, each piece of data is called an instance field and it's a really descriptive name because it's to say that each sale has a unique instance of an inventory number, uh, sale amount and tax owed. So for every sale object, they have their own instance of these fields, okay? So AKA instance fields. So they're very, you know, accurately named. I'm also gonna point out to you something that I didn't point out as closely last week is that these are scoped um, with the uh, private um, access modifier, okay? So, this implements uh, instance fields are marked private by convention because this implements an object-oriented programming principle called data hiding. So this is, I know it's Monday morning, I know you guys are waking up, but zone in with this here, okay? We mark our instance fields as private because it hides the data. And then what we do is with our public methods or our public properties, we provide access to the data, okay? So with data hiding, we provide controlled, and it's controlled access to our data with methods, and or properties okay now here's the deal if you mark these instance fields as private then users of this class then people then developers who are using this class and coding with this class they can put whatever they want into a string right they can put whatever they want into this decimal okay now in our business we might say a sale amount has to be greater than $10,000. Okay, so just imagine with me, we don't sell any product less than $10,000. So we can implement in our properties or in our methods, we can implement that business rule. We can say, hey, if the sale amount is less than $10,000, don't allow it. Okay, that's controlled access to our data. Yes? Um, would we know what time Yeah. When, would it, if we were to need to change it to a public class, would like our our example tell us to make a public class? Or? Right now, always make it public. By convention in this class, always make it public. Okay. okay. By convention in this class, always mark your fields as private because it implements data hiding. What is data hiding? It provides controlled access to our data. If you don't control the access to our data, you can put whatever you want in there. Right? If you mark these fields as public, then you could put a $1,000 sale in our sale amount as a user, as a developer using this sale class. But the business, through the business logic, we might instead write a method that says, hey, when you go to set the sale amount, don't accept any values less than $1,000, or less than $10,000, I should say. Okay? So... So last week, we just did this. We marked all of our instance fields as private and I didn't explain why. It's really important, that explanation why. Data hiding provides controlled access to our data so that we can implement business logic and essentially control what goes in and how the data comes out, right? So um, marking these instance fields as private is um is good okay so to continue this demo it says include a property with get and set accessors for the first two but make tax oh the tax should be calculated when the sale is set okay now this is a really good example of a time to do something that i haven't shown yet okay and so i'm gonna change inventory number to 
to what's called an auto implemented property. Okay. Zone in, guys. Zone in. I see a lot of distraction. Okay. If you're coding the labs, I want you to stop. I'm not, I do not want you to code the labs right now. Close the labs. If you're distracted on your phones, close your phones. You see auto implemented properties everywhere in C sharp. Okay. It's, it's very common when you create a class to see auto implemented properties. Now notice what I'm going to do here. Remember last week, how many times did I say it's all about the instance fields? I said it 15 times last week. It's all about the instance fields. Right now I've got three instance fields. Okay, I've got no properties, I've got no methods. It's all my classes. I'm going to comment out one of my instance fields and I'm gonna make an auto implemented property for that instance field. Now notice the convention. Let me show you what an, it's a property. You know what a property is. If you paid attention last week, you know what a property is. This property is a shorthand property. Okay, and so is, is my favorite hotkey in Visual Studio is to type the word prop and then hit tab tab. Prop tab tab brings in an auto implemented property. Prop tab tab brings this in. Now, because my data type, I'm working with inventory number, is a string. I'm gonna change this in, the, into a string and I'm gonna change the name of the property to capital inventory number. The number one thing that people get confused about this, about these auto implemented properties, when, when I make on line 23, when I make a property called inventory number with a capital I, get in set block, shorthand notation, that's all it is. This is a very standard way to put data into something called inventory number. Basically, I want you to look at line 18. When I code line 23, Remember, you get some things you get for free. The instance field, line 18, you get for free. So when I code line 23, this property called inventory number, you no longer have to code the instance field. Okay, so that's the trick, if you will. This is a very shorthand way of making a property and you do not have to associate it with an instance field. Now, so this is just, this is shorthand. It creates, oh, Max, how did you dismiss that? Max, you're going to have to watch this lecture. It creates the instance field for you. So many beginners, when they're making auto-implemented properties, think that they still have to code line 18, and that is a mistake. Okay, that will cause bugs in your code. Okay, when you make line 23, you no longer make the instance field because you get it for free, it's coded for you. Okay, now let me just demonstrate how this, this would work if I just view the code. Again, this is called the constructor. If I were to go sale my sale equals new sale, use the default constructor, I could say my sale dot, and now I've got inventory number, and I can put in, you know, three A, B, whatever. Okay, so this is a property just like we've done before, except you no longer have to code the instance fields. Let me show you the longhand version of this, okay? This right here, I'm gonna show you what we did last week with sale amount, right? I'm gonna make a normal property public decimal sale amount, get return sale amount, set sale amount to value. Remember doing this last week? Line 30 does the same thing as this property, lines 23 through 27, and line 19, right? So much shorter hand, right? Auto-implemented properties are super common. Okay, they're used all over the C-sharp world. Okay, you'll see. How come you didn't start with this showing effect? Good question. Um, because then you wouldn't understand when you see it the other way. 
you still have to know the other way. You still have to know because it's that's out there. That code will be out there when you still have the instance fields. And and, and let me let me answer that another way. Number one, you're going to see code where they still use instance fields. Number two. Remember I said data hiding. Data hiding allows controlled access to your variables. Inventory number has no controls. No controls, meaning I can put whatever I want into inventory number. If you want controlled access to your data, meaning you want certain rules around your data, you can't use auto implemented. You have to use, you have to use the more traditional approach. Okay, so if you want business rules that say like sale amount can't be bigger than 10,000. Like let me let me put this in here. So here I'm I'm just going to show you an example of our rule. Right? Data comes in as value to a set block. So we can look at value and we can say if value is greater than or equal to 10,000 then set the value. See, now I'm providing controlled access, else we're gonna set sale amount equal to you know, zero. So this, is, this would represent, this would be good data. This would represent bad data, okay? You see how I'm controlling access? Inside of my set block, if the value is greater than $10,000, then we set the value. Otherwise, we don't set the value. We set it to some sort of like initial like zero or negative one or whatever, whatever you want to decide how to handle that situation. Okay, so Ryan, that's a good question. Why didn't I just start by showing you this? Because you can't use it in every case, right? You can't use it in every case. You can only use it in the case that you allow whatever data in and, and basically you allowed full data out, like uncontrolled access. Okay, good question. Christian. If you um, look at the instance field and the property experience as different uh, data types, how do you convert them? Uh, I would just make them the same. I think you're looking at one of the labs where it's like, oh, yeah. yeah, just make them the same. Oh, okay. Yep, we just make them the same. Okay, now I think I think in the in, in here, um, this is a good example because I don't need to do anything fancy with my inventory number, because I don't need to do anything fancy with my inventory number. It's a good it's a good property to use auto implemented. Okay. Um, however, my sale amount it said when you configure sale amount when you set sale amount, also set the tax owed. So uh, let me look at my, my rules here. The tax is calculated when the sale is set. Assume the tax is 8% for the first 100 and 6% for any amount greater than 100. Okay. Um, so this, this was my made up scenario, so I'm, I'm not gonna do that. So, um, We're just gonna set sale amount equal to value because there's no rules around that in the actual problem. Um, but we also have to figure tax owed. So I'll set tax owed equals um, the initial, so for the first 100, so if, if value is less than or equal to 100 so for the first 100 so including 100 so if it's less than or equal to 100 tax owed is equal to value times point 08 and now we've got decimal and double so decimal so we put the m here so get the 0.08, which is a double into a decimal. Okay. Otherwise, uh, tax owed is equal to. So for the first hundred, 
Um, the first hundred will take a calculator. And for the first hundred dollars times 0.08 is eight dollars. Eight dollars for the first hundred plus value minus 100. So you, you say, okay, a thousand dollars. Now you take a thousand dollars minus the 100. You got nine hundred dollars to pay left of tax. Uh, I'm gonna have to wrap. The, my parentheses right around this times 0.06 um, and we got decimal and double again so let's do that and that okay so that was not needing it uh, so eight dollars plus that's 900 times 0.06 so that'll do order of operations it'll do my multiplication this gets nine, again, I'm just going with $1,000. You get the $8 for the first 100, 900 times 0 0.06. You add that together, that should be correctly calculating tax owed. Okay, um, this was a good example. We couldn't do an auto implemented property on sale amount because we needed to do more logic in our set block, right? You. You don't have a set block in here to, to do more logic. Again, auto implemented properties, you can put whatever in, but there's no rules in there. You can pull, you pull it out, put it in, pull it out, but there's no extra rules. But there's extra rules inside of here. And it says, hey, in this set block, we need to also configure tax owed. So it's like, ah, we can't really do that. We can't do that with an auto implemented property. Um, so that's sale amount. And then the last thing to do, it says make a read only property for tax owed. And so this is a read only property for tax owed. Okay, all that means is it's a get block, nothing else. So I'll say public decimal tax owed. And we're gonna have a get block return tax owed. And that's, so you set the tax owed when you set the sale price and then you can get it out using the property. But again, this is not an auto-implemented property. Why? It's not auto-implemented because you don't have both a get and set. Notice auto-implemented has a very standard get block, a very standard set block. So if that's all you got, that's auto-implemented. Would it really not work completely? Like if you remove, let's say, a, a, uh, the set block from it? Yeah, you know, um, I guess you could. I guess you could just have a get block or just a set block. So um, to, your, to answer your question, let's just, but no, I, I, you still can't do it because tax owed has to be set in a very specific way, right? So I'm just going to have a standard read-only property on the way out. Now, one more thing with this auto-implemented property because it enables you to do something pretty cool when you have auto-implemented properties. And that's called an object uh, initializer. And so, um, I, I have to wrap back around, let me flush out this, this example and then I'll, I'll wrap back around to this concept of an object initializer. So here, let's go to, uh, let's just add a button and um, okay, so it's going to say add sales and display. Okay, so we're going to put in um, text box for text box for sale amount text sale amount and a label that says sale amount copy and paste it and we're also going to have a inventory number
Okay. Oop, let me undo that. Let me give my button a name. Button add sale. Okay, so let me get rid of this. I'm gonna have a list of sale objects. Called daily sales is new list of sale objects. Now I'm gonna scope this differently, right? Because I don't want to create this list every time I click the button. Um, so I'm gonna create my daily sales basically when the form loads. And when I click the button, I'm gonna say daily sales dot add a new sale. And you know the first time that's going to be at zero, right? So I'll say int count is zero. I'll call it sales count. Can you just use count? Can you just? Uh, you know there is a count property, so but that would be one. So you'd have to subtract the uh, one off of that, right? But you could you could do something like this. You could do daily sales sub. Uh, daily sales dot count minus one dot sale amount equals convert to decimal text sale amount dot text. Okay, let's talk about this. We've got a list and we're adding the first item to the list. So we add a new sale when you click the button. And then we want to set in that first element that's at that's at zero, right? So you do daily sales dot count minus one because the count is one. You got to subtract one to get to zero, right? So daily sales dot count minus one gets you index zero, which is your first sale dot sale amount, and then you read it out of the text box, right? So this is going to put data into that 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 object. And you do the same thing for the daily sales sub daily sales dot count minus one dot uh, inventory number equals text inventory number dot text. So that's the, that's the only two pieces of data that you have to put in. And right, this would grow until you know if if there's ten objects, you could you could put a cap on it at the upper bounds and only allow 10 objects to go in if, if you wanted to, right? Um, and then let's just do a for each, for each sale item in daily sales. And I'm gonna put a two string method in here. It doesn't call for it, but I, I just really like two string methods because it allows you to pull all the data in one place. And so now notice my tax owed. I have a property for tax owed. I've got an inventory get block and a sale amount get block. Okay, so I'm just gonna use my properties in my two strings. So I'll play public override two string method. We're gonna learn a little more about this override soon. And I'll put in my um, item number, and what do we call this, inventory? Okay, this is inventory. Sale item info, inventory number, inventory number. Um, had a sale amount of sale amount currency and a tax owed of tax owed property. So I'm using my properties in my two string and I'll put in a new line so that every time I call two string it prints out the inventory number, the sale amount, and the tax owed. 
So back over here in my for each loop, I can call item.toString and put it inside of a result label. Call this label result and auto size to false, get some sort of that going on. And label result dot text plus equals item dot to string. And again, the to string will have a line break in it. And then you just got to put some logic in here to kind of cap it at 10 items. But let's just say. Yeah, let's uh, let's do that. So each time label result dot text will clear it out every time you click the button, so that it doesn't continually append. Good eye. And let's run it and see what breaks. So this is sales demo. Ten thousand inventory one A to B. Sale item info inventory 1A2B had a sale amount of 10,000 and tax owed is 602. Need to double check my math, but let's do 9,000, 3C, 4D. Tax goes down. Again, double check your math. If I just say $100 and 5E, or 6D. E. Okay, that looks right. Tax owed of eight dollars for the first hundred. Okay, you can see that it's adding each one to the list, and you could do that up to ten times. Well, uh, my label ran out of room, but that is a working piece now. One last thing that I wanted to show is this concept of a uh, object initializer. And um, now that I've, I've solved that problem, I'm going to simplify this sale class. I'm just gonna kind of delete it. And I'm gonna have the same three properties with no specific rules. Very, uh, again, it's a, it's a simpler problem. Um, but we do prop tab tab string was it inventory number and I hit enter enter prop tab tab uh, what were my properties there was a sale amount and a tax decimal sale amount enter enter prop prop tab tab decimal tab tab tax owed enter enter okay so again I've I've simplified this class down no extra rules I've just created three auto implemented properties um, for the sake of demonstrating one thing so again if I go back to what we learned last week we get this default constructor for free this is called the default constructor and so kind of back over here this line right here line 16 calls on the default constructor um, but I want to show you last week if we wanted to if we wanted to overload the constructor, which we did, we did something like this. We did public sale string inventory number. Boy, did that fill in super fast. We now have a way, we now have an overloaded constructor where we can put in three pieces of data. And that allows me to over here if I wanted to say, sale my sale 
new sale, I could use this overloaded constructor, pass in an inventory number, 1A, 2B, pass in a decimal of 3,000, and the tax owed, again, this is kind of changing the, the problem a little bit, but let's just say 400 taxes. Everyone take a look at line 15 for me and, and, and realize what that's doing. Line 15 is creating an instance of a sale, or in other words, creating a sale object using an overloaded constructor. Okay, we overloaded this constructor over here Constructor is a method with the same name as the class, and it takes three parameters. And last week we learned, hey, you might have to overload a constructor four or five times to allow flexibility in how you can construct objects. You can build them using all these different potential constructors. When you have auto-implemented properties, you get a really interesting syntax where you actually don't have to overload 15 constructors. And you can pass in data using these what are called object initializers. Let me show you another way. Line 15 could be constructed another way, not using the constructor, your sale equals new sale. Notice this is the default constructor. However, you can pass in these uh, curlies and say inventory number equals uh, 3C4D comma sale amount equals 4,000 comma tax owed equals 400. Look how similar lines 15 and 16 are. Line 16 is using the default constructor with the auto-implemented properties. And so you're really given a lot of flexibility when you have auto-implemented properties. Like what if I didn't want to set the taxes owed? Well, I could just create an object that doesn't set the taxes owed. Okay. Do you have to call them in a certain order? No, you put them in whatever order works for you, right? So again, I did, this is another benefit of using auto-implemented properties is that now I don't have to overload 10 constructors to, to set my data. Now I can use this object initializer and that just, it just offers a lot of flexibility in how you construct your objects. You don't have to overload a bunch of different constructors. Okay, big takeaway from today, big takeaway from today, <clears throat> if you got one thing, when you use these auto-implemented properties, the shorthand, you do not code the instance field. The instance field is created for free when you use auto-implemented properties. And if you do not remember that or you do not pay attention right now and you code that instance field, uh, that will cause some conflicts that will cause you some problems okay you, you'll you'll have some bugs you'll introduce some bugs into your code if you do that things will not work okay um, all right I'm gonna stop there let you guys work on some labs I did not do this part two but it's not as important as some of the other concepts I covered yeah question Just to be clear, yep you're making an auto one. yep Yes, okay. it creates them for you. Okay. Yep. Uh, like, look what happens if I do. Um, if I say private string, I think it's going to give me a, a warning and say it's never used, even if I try. Nah, you know what? Again, it's just going to create some, some bugs. You get this. You get line 11 for free when you code line 13. Somewhere along the way, it'll give you some warnings. All right, glad you asked that.